Oh, my God. Okay, everybody, smile. We're live. They're handing them We'll stand. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to get started you... here. <laughs> I have a phone so that was found up. in the other room. I'm gonna if anybody up. lost their phone, I have it. Hmm? What's the title of the film? Of the film? Of the, what, what, are we supposed to be doing something? We're going to be, I'm going to be interviewing. Okay. That's okay. Please take yeah, a seat so we can get the, the programming film. going. So I won't be redundant and talk about a lot of this. We'd stuff like to have these pleasure. chairs up front filled. So please grab a chair. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> so we'll who are you? What are you that. doing here? So what I'll what I'll do is I'll go to you first, you second, and then you third, and then you talk about the legal stuff. And then uh, I'm just going to be a handheld. My name is Marcella Gilbert. So I can talk to him and hand you the I, um, answer, and then you can look towards the lifelong member of the American look. Indian Movement. And then if, if a I, student I of We Will Remember like Survival this. Group. Just finish up your water uh, protector, like 45 minutes. wife, finish, mother, finish thoughts, grandmother. I go like this with my hand to get the mic back. Um, and just finish your I'm also part of the Warrior Women so Project. And, go, and the Warrior Women Project organized like a, this event like today. <laughs> we wanted to take time to recognize the matriarchs right. of Wounded Knee. And I know there's several who are here today. Wounded Knee Veterans from 1973. So we wanted to take this time to recognize them and share some of the work that Elizabeth Castle has been doing for going on 25 years now. She came to my mother's home on Shine River that long ago and asked, you know, wanted to interview her because she was working on a paper. And as she was doing her research, she noticed all this stuff coming up about Wounded Knee and Madonna Thunderhawk. And she had no idea. So, so she spent the last 25 years researching and doing amazing interviews. And this is a, just a small example of some of her work, some of the interviews that she's done. And she continues to do that. So like I said, um, those of you who want to share your, your story or your family's story about Wounded Knee, uh, we would like to have, you know, give you the opportunity to be interviewed so that your story can become part of the Warrior Women Project, the Oral History Archive. And I do want to be clear that you have access to your story. We're not taking it. We're not saying, well, this is mine now, because it's not. But you have access to your story. We just want to be able to archive it because Unless, I mean, if you guys know, let us know, is there somewhere in this country where this history of warrior women in the American Indian Movement, the Red Power Movement, where is that history? And where is it being stored? And who's sharing it? And who's telling it? So this is part of what Warrior Women Project wants to do is provide the opportunity for you to tell your history and that through the Warrior Women Project we can share it so that people learn our history from us. So I wanted to express that and just let you know who, you know, it's the Warrior Women Project that is, this is our event here that we want to do as part of the celebration of Wounded Knee, 1973, 50th anniversary. This is our contribution to, the, to what's happening this weekend. So I wanted to make sure 
I, w I shared that information with you. So what we're going to do right now is watch an intro to the Warrior Women Project. It's a two-minute video. So we're going to be, oh, and I want to also explain just a little bit here. This setup here, um, the Najo Society on Shine River, where I'm at, myself and one of our team here, we, we um, co-founded the, this group focusing on violence against women, and we got a grant from Working Films, and this is part of what we got, we got to keep this equipment because we were showing the Warrior Women film and we were showing films about MMIW, MMIR, things like that over the last year. So this equipment comes from the Najo Society on Shine River. And so we're happy that we could contribute to today as well. So we got a two minute video. Lights please. The Warrior Women Project is based on interviews with all of the women who I could get to who were Native activists, Indigenous activists in the Red Power Movement. And it spans the fishing rights, Alcatraz, all over, whenever it was possible, interviewing anybody who was part of this solidarity-focused, transformative period. Right now we have just more and more just blossoming of the interviews that were done, a lot of them with women whose stories, um, you know, their family still needs to know. I think the Warrior Women Project, by, by focusing on women, has not only opened the eyes of the world to our reality and our power, but also ha has forged a path for others, especially young people. You know, to participate in your own recording of your own history. You know, we can't rely on the army. And then it was the Jesuits that came in and they did the worst, you know? But they recorded everything. But now we gotta stop that thinking and we have to do it ourselves and be active. We're not subjects of somebody's project or something or somebody's degree. This is ongoing, this is living history and we have to be a part of it. That's what I learned from Warrior Women. So now I want to take some time to introduce the Warrior Women Project team. So will the team come up, please? You know who you are. You're wearing a shirt just like me. So we have Raya from Shine River. She's the great granddaughter of Marcella LeBeau. And I told you, she's, she's my part, she, her and I are part of Najo. We're the ones who got the, this equipment. She's currently helping with the efforts to return Wounded Knee 1890 items from Glasgow Museum in Scotland. She joined the Warrior Women Project in 2021 and focused on the social media for today's event. Raya LeBeau. Chris, Chris has worked with Madonna since 2008 on ICWA and water issues in the Dakotas. In 2016, he spent time at Ocheti Shagoi camp with Madonna and Phyllis Young documenting direct actions and related treaty meetings. He has worked for Warrior Women since 2021, and he designed the banners and edited the videos for this exhibit. Where is he? Earth, Earth is an enrolled member of Yamasi Indian Tribe of Seminoles, serving as their cultural and government liaison. She is also a software engineer, DJ, and Indigenous Peoples Movement Coalition founding member. She was one of the main organizers for the Indigenous Peoples March in DC in 2019. Earth joined Warrior Women Project last year and worked with the press and through social media to get the word out about today's event. 
Morwenna Maz is from Wales. Her parents and extended family are lifelong activists in struggles for Welsh self-determination and Welsh language resurgence. Maz has worked for the Warrior Women Project since 2020 doing historical research and proce processing the oral history archive. She helped research and write the text that appears in this exhibit. Wyatt is from Crow Creek, South Dakota. For the past 12 years, he has worked with tribes, tribal organizations on research projects in the field of public health. Wyatt got involved with the Warrior Women Project while he was at school at the University of South Dakota in Vermilion. He has helped coordinate all of the work that went into making today happen. Thank you, Wyatt. So I wanted to take the time to introduce our team because these are the people who will be taking interviews. So those of you who want to offer your interview, and it doesn't have to be today, you guys are going to be here through Monday, right? So they'll be around if you want to share an interview or some history with them to be archived. So we will be moving into, thank you guys. We'll be moving into the round table discussion. We invited some key players from American Indian Movement and Wounded Knee 1973. We have Robert Pilot from Native Roots Radio. He's, uh, his people are from Minnesota. <laughs> Anishinaabe, is it Anishinaabe? Ho-Chunk. Oh, Ho-Chunk, sorry. Ho I'm sorry. Wa. He's Ho-Chunk, <laughs> sorry. Um, but he's going to facilitate this roundtable. Uh, this is um, not necessarily an opportunity to ask questions. We just want to hear the voices of the women sitting at the table. So following the round roundtable discussion, um, El Elizabeth will introduce the, the exhibit. So all yours, Robert. Pinagigi, thank you. Hey, Kadagi, to all my friends and relatives in four directions, I'm Robert Pilot, and I'm really honored to be here at this live streaming interactive Warrior Women Project, uh, Wounded Knees 50th anniversary. And I, we, I want to get going really quick here, and I want, I want uh, Lavetta Yago to introduce herself, and I want to talk to you about one of the things you were 19 years old, 18. 18 years old. How did you feel and when did this become real to you? My name is Lavetta Yego. I'm from the Kiowa tribe in Oklahoma. And I, I was 18 when I first went in to, uh, for the takeover. And when I left, I turned 19. I had a birthday inside. Nobody made a cake for me. But anyway, <laughs> um, what I experienced there, being young and naive, I didn't know anything about what was actually going on until years later when I started reflecting back. And the experiences that I've seen, that I've that I've ex that I've seen and that I personally went through was uh, was scary because being young and naive and not, not knowing anything, you know, I I uh, I didn't you know it was scary. I thought I was that real tough country girl, but it, deep inside, you know, uh, it was just a facade. But after I left, went home. Throughout the years, it was a great experience and a teaching for me because I didn't know my own tribal ways. Our people, um, I wasn't raised tribal, our, 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 our ceremonies. We had ceremonies and stuff like that, but we, I wasn't raised that way. But I went home and I did, I went around the elders that we had and I sat down with them and I started asking questions. And I told them where I came from, where I've been, 
that they told me that, and the family that I came from, they said, you have that warrior spirit oh. within you. Your family comes from warriors. And I didn't know that, you know, until I started researching. And when I researched, and we researched until after our, our, our dad passed away because he used to always tell us, you know, keep, a, keep your name good. And that's why there's a reason why he said that. Wow, Pina Gigi, thank you so much. Madonna, you were a young warrior too, but you were a veteran, a veteran of Alcatraz. Um, what was different about this than all the other, you know, my understanding is that you uh, were in a caravan and all of a sudden wounded knee happened and it was a large caravan as it was spoken. What, what was the difference? What, what made this different? Well, you know, I, I don't think it was that much different because it was always a land struggle. You know, I think to the generations, that's what it's always been with our people because that's who we are, we're the land. So, um, but there were so many events and things going on in the Red Power Movement uh, in those days, you know, that it, it didn't seem like it was it, it seemed like it was a continuation because so many things happened before Wounded Knee and then so many things happened after. Um, but what happened at Wounded Knee again became an international uh, it, you know, happening. And uh, that's when we realized then that um, we weren't alone. I think that was a, had a lot to do with it that we realized even though the um, media was limited, because it was a male-dominated, non-native press on all levels, um, so you know it. Just the fact that um, it went international, you know, was really important because, again, we thought, yes, the land, you know, we're we we have every right to make a stand, you know, we make that decision. That's what I learned. And I wasn't that young. I was in, I was, you know, 33 years old. I was one of the old guys. <laughs> Pina Gigi, I, uh, we have uh, Joanne Brown, who's the writer of Voices from Wounded Knee. Your call to action was a little different. Uh, can you explain that to our audience here? Um, how you came about coming to Wounded Knee and what you ended up finding for yourself? <clears throat> sure. Um, I was 26 or 25, I think, and I was working on a, a radio show uh, that fed college radio stations. And I was mostly working on the Vietnam War and Asian stuff. And then Wounded Knee happened. And I was trying to get information about it so I could cover it. And after a short time, it became harder and harder. So my colleague and I, um, Barbara Lou Schaefer decided, well, let's just go out there. So we got in my little red uh, Volkswagen and we drove out to um, Pine Ridge and uh, we went into the BIA and we showed our press credentials and they gave us press passes and then we went into Wounded Knee and a few days after we were there, the uh, government ordered all the press to leave. Mm. So ABC, CB, CBS, NBC, they all picked up their, they had big vans and they would cook steaks and drink wine in them and they, they all picked up and left. And so um, Lou and I said, well, if they're leaving, we have to stay because we don't know what's going to happen. If there's going to be violence, we have to be here to witness it. So we ended up staying till the end of the occupation and then we stayed a little bit longer for the uh, negotiations between some of the chiefs and the government. And what did I get out of it? Well, it was an amazing experience. Uh, I had already participated in one or two uh, Indian protests around the Onondaga Reservation, which was near where, I, near where I went to school, and they were trying to save a little slip of land on their six square miles of reservation. And 
Um, so we all went to um, talk to the governor who was taking it, and it was, I just remember that very clearly because everybody was, I mean, the Indian people, especially the chiefs, were dressed, you know, in full regalia, and out came uh, Governor Rockefeller, I think, and he was just a little small guy in a gray suit, and he looked really so less powerful than the Indian people who were there. And so that was my other experience first that got me really interested in Wounded Knee. And I learned a lot about community, and I learned a lot about um, standing up for something you believe. And it was a really remarkable group of people. And I have to say, I also agree, it was a lot, uh, the leaders were men, but a lot of the people behind the whole event were women. And some of those are in the book that we wrote. Oh, you asked about the book. So then we had all these tapes of interviews and meetings and everything. And Aquasasne notes, if you know, they used to be up in the Mohawk Reservation. They asked us to come and do a book. Or we sort of, so we went up there and lived on a, in a little wood farmhouse for about 12 months and put this book together. Oh, thank you so much. Hey, we also have Fran Olson, who uh, was with the Wounded Knee Legal Defense and Offense Committee. And so you came about this a little later after the struggle began. Can you tell us a little bit about what your participation is? And I know Madonna talked about you earlier, and as it was so happy to see you and your posse show up here for this, for this, uh, uh, <laughs> this, uh, you know, celebration of our matriarchs of Wounded Knee. Um, so tell a little bit about where you fit into this picture. It's for the first time I've ever thought about the possibility of having a posse, I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> the, after about the first week, um, the government, the USA government, had announced that they were going to break down the, bar the barricades of Wounded Knee and arrest everybody. And Roman Robodeau, who was the only Native American lawyer in South Dakota at that time, put, called um, the National Lawyer, Lawyers Guild offices around the country to see if they could get some help because he realized if they arrested a huge number of people, just the simple processing would be very time consuming. Now, I was a, young, I was a very young lawyer at that time, but I knew I could process people. I could do what I could do. And so a fellow um, radical lawyer and I drove up from Denver, and we came with a commitment to stay for a week. We were, we were blocked at the, at the government bl blockade for a long time. But finally, we made contact with Ron Robodeau, and we got through. And after, and so, of course, the government, you can never trust the government, even if they say they're going to arrest you. They don't necessarily. And so the government backed down. During this time, they kept, all, they kept um, sending, trying to send people or asking for people. The people who were supposed to be acting, uh, helping doing something, serving the government, at, the US government at Wounded Knee, kept getting indicted because Watergate was busy going on about this time also. And so the whole country was realizing the government was crooks. But they still stood up and acted like they were supporting law and order at Wounded Knee. Mm. Um, after a week, uh, my colleague had to go back. And the people of Wounded Knee, who I, I knew best, were saying, you're not going to leave, are you? I said, no, of course not. And so I stayed the rest of the 71 days wow. and was very pleased to do so. I divided my time somewhat between Rapid City and Wounded Knee. Because we had a lot of young, a lot of lawyers began to offer to volunteer to help, and it's very hard to know how to actually make good use of somebody who can come in for only a week or only two, only two weeks. And so there were a core of us that were sort of, it was important to sort of make plans and organize litigation and get things going and keep things going and being able to actually put lawyers to, to useful work. So that's a lot of how I got involved in what I was doing. One of the things that impressed me the most in the, throughout the entire period, but it, it first struck me, was that um, the, the local leaders of the movement were largely women, and the national leaders of AIM were largely men. 
When the government came into town, into Wounded Knee to negotiate, or actually to try to tell us the way things had to be, and that we better ha take down our arms, and, and if, we ever, if they ever expect anything to come out of this, you better close up. Um, when they came into town, they kept trying to limit the participants to the AIM members, and the AIM members, to their deep credit, refused to have, allow the government to, sep to set out, uh, separate out the women, to keep them, the local people, in the background. Because the movement had all begun as a local movement, and the women leaders were very important. And AIM immediately knew that, respected it, and forced that recognition upon the government. They subsequently forgot it, but they remember little bits of it. So that's what's impressed me. I want, I'd like to mention one thing about one of the early successes we had as lawyers was when the government tried to stop food from coming into Wounded Knee. They had these, these roadblocks and they tried to stop food coming in. They claimed, well, we don't, you never know, there may be guns in that food. Somebody talked about, about some sort of Pops cereal. That must be guns or weapons. And we want them to run out of guns and weapons, so we won't let food in because we can't be sure. So um, we brought a lawsuit. Hmm. A couple of us who interviewed a bunch of the people figured out that yes, that was happening. There were, there were people in the churches in Rapid City gathering large quantities of food and wanting to send food in. So we brought a lawsuit because there's no legal basis upon which you can block food coming into a place. And that was the first time a federal judge was actually willing to say, yeah, yeah, blocking food from human beings, including, we emphasized the women and children, but that that was really a, a bad thing to do. So we got an injunction saying, you can't block food. You've got to, and we worked it all out. They, we, they had permission to open up our trunks and look through all the food, check for any pots or any, anything else, look at everybody, look at us and fill out FBI reports on us and so forth. Um, and then at that time, the government, I shouldn't say this because I don't know it, but it happened that, that um, the, um, Dickie Wilson and his crew, uh, they called themselves goons, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Dickie Wilson and his goons uh, set up another roadblock. And apparently that was the roadblock that it was the, block, the real thing that kept, um, it kept made it difficult to get food and legal services into Wounded Knee. Um, now some of us, some people could climb over the, over the fields. Some of the medical people who came to volunteer did climb over the fields. Sometimes they would be let in, but sometimes they wouldn't. Um, so under this pretense, what they had is, we were subjected to the Dickie Wilson Goon, gr Goon Group, who basically at gunpoint took away the food. And as we were leaving, according to Mark Lane, who I'm sure is telling the truth, they shot at us, uh, shot at the, at the car. So I too have been under fire. In any event, and it's really interesting because we viewed the injunction as a success. And the fact that they took away food did have an effect upon people. We were able to get that publicized. It was able to be seen by the nation that, there were the, that the, it wasn't simply a, uh, Indians versus Indians and gosh, the government doesn't play a role. They saw that the effort to block and destroy the act, actions at Wounded Knee were being facilitated with the help of friendly Indians, mm. which has been a long strategy of any colonial power. Um, yeah. And the ironic thing, which is interesting, is it, in, uh, in that sense it was a, a success, but so like so many legal successes, the clients, the people of Wounded Knee, didn't get anything directly out of it. No mm -hmm. food came in directly because of that. Wow. And yet it was a legal success and I wouldn't want to underrate that. Thank you so much, that was amazing. <laughs> Madonna, I, I kind of know you. Uh, last time I was here at Wounded Knee, uh, you were on a horse and I'm going, oh my gosh, this lady's 80 years old and she's on a horse. Um, I want to ask you, you know, what was the mood like there? We know you have a good sense of humor, but you, we know from people that knew you back in the day that you were also a taskmaster. 
Where was the fine line and did you have time to use your great sense of humor? <laughs> well, I didn't have to really uh, worry about, you know, using a sense of humor because, I mean, we were all, all Indians, you know, and that's, that's what Indians do, you know. Um, <laughs> and that's how you get through things, you know, and things that the rougher it gets, the funnier people are, you know. <laughs> and it, it, we all know that, you know, that, that, that's how it works. But, yeah, um, you know what happened with, with Wounded Knee individually, I don't know, but, you know, just from what we were doing and, and it was more like, well, we're here, you know, and we'll just make the best of it. So nobody was complaining, nobody was scared, nobody was panicking. And in fact, the younger ones that I know of would go in and out. Oh, yeah. They'd sneak out, go to rap and hang out for a while, you know, and come back with the latest news, you know, <laughs> let us know and stuff. And they'd always have a backpack, you know, and some of them would have instant coffee. Oh, mm. Andrea Rabadou is right here. She was one of the medics, okay? And one time she came in and she, she said, Madonna, look what I found. I said, what? She said, she went like this. And here there was two packs of instant coffee. Boy, we looked at each other and got real quiet. I mean, there was nobody in there but her and I, you know, and a couple of people that were in the, you know, patients that were in there, you know, for, for other, other things, you know. And so we got real quiet like that. And he said, come on. So we went over and we really put the water on to heat up the water, you know, pretending like we were cleaning up or doing something, you know. We got the hot water and we went into my room, which was a storeroom eventually, because we were in the, the clinic was in the building where the, where the trade post, trading post owners lived. So it was kind of fancy, you know, and it had this big utility room. So it was big enough to have a, you know, bed in there and stuff. So we went in there real quiet, shut the door, and we sat down and we drank that instant coffee. You know, and looking around like, you know, someone was going to come and take it away. I mean, it was precious, you know. So those are the kind of things that I remember. I mean, you know, I don't remember everybody being scared. Hey, we knew the firefights were going to happen. We got used to that, you know. And um, so that's what we did. You know, as soon as the flares went up, you know, the, the feds lit up the ground every night. Flares would hit the at different intervals so that the whole area was lit up. So as soon as the flares started going out, we got ready and crawled out to the bunkers because we knew the firefight was going to start. So it kind of became routine. Mm -hmm. Survival instinct, you know? Mm -hmm. Surrounded by ancestors. Oh, wow. I, I just have one quick question, too, uh, is I noticed there were ribbon shirts worn by the women, but no, <laughs> no, no ribbon dresses. Do you, what, what, why was that back then? That was a different era, you know? <laughs> a different time, you know? How are you gonna run in a fancy ribbon skirt? <laughs> yeah. You know? How are you gonna charge a, a barricade, you know, with a ribbon skirt, you know? So we did the ribbon shirts. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you had a, a situation where you had to go to the bathroom and something happened and you felt really, we talked earlier about this, intense fear for a moment. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we remember saying that I was young and naive and uh, I wasn't going to give him any glory, who was my ex-husband at the time, who was my husband, he's my ex now. Um, I thought I was safe under his, be, you know, being with him, and, uh, but he was a Vietnam vet. So he, I kind of had, you know, a little trust, because I didn't really trust people anyway. And um, I woke up that morning to gunshots. And we were in a firefight. And when we was, uh, you know, Mother Nature wakes you up. When you wake up, you know, Mother Nature is calling you. So I said, oh, I poked him and I told him, I said, I need to go. I need to go, I need to go. And he said, okay. But some, some smart, 
person thought he had a great idea he was going to build us a outhouse, <laughs> you know, instead of going down to the creek. You know, I didn't mind going down the creek, but it was a little bit unsafe for us. So, so I told, told my ex, I said, let's, you know, I, I got to go. So he had that smart person, he had built a six foot hole in the ground. It never did finish what he started. <laughs> and um, and uh, so it was just a hole. So my ex, he told me, he says, come on, I know you can go. And he, he, uh, he said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll watch your back. And uh, so he, he told me, he said, jump in that hole. Before, you know, he was telling me what to do before I went out. And so when I opened the door, they, you know, they shot at us. God. And then I didn't really get scared, you know, and I just said, darn it, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so he said, go ahead, run, because he was uh, kind of like uh, timing the shots, you know, because where they were going, they were going to different areas. And then so we kind of got cleared a little bit. So I went and I jumped in that hole and I did my thing. And I said, thank you, Mother Nature. And I said, I appreciate this. And I said, I am. Um, got to make sure I get back safe. But he told me, he said, when you get through, he says, kind of, you know, let me know when you're, you're, you're through. So I did. And I, just a few inch mm -hmm. from that hole, of course, I wasn't only standing in my piss, I was standing in my feces. You know, and I wasn't ashamed because I did that, it's just natural, you know. And, and, and so I let him know that I was ready to come out, but he was kind of like still timing the shots because they were still shooting towards us. And I just barely, they'd seen my head, the top of my head, they had my hair, and they were shooting at us. And so it, I guess they must have thought I was a sniper. <laughs> and um, so I, I, they, uh, I, you know, I stuck my head on, they see my head, and I got back down, and just before I was getting ready to go back down, I felt the wind of the bullets. Mm -hmm. Not knowing, but not knows what I'm feeling. Not knowing, you know, I was, we were close to death. A lot of us felt that, but that was my first experience, not knowing what being in war, mm. a military, militarized zone war, because where my bunker was, that's the same bunker where Frank Clearwater got murdered. Our bunker was in the demilitarized zone, right there. And, and, and I didn't realize that until after I got, I got her book. Mm. And I see that because she's got her bunker in there. Wow. And I didn't realize that, but Thank you for that. And um, but that was an experience that stuck with me oh. throughout these years. You know, the 50 years, I re remember it to this day because that was something I'll never forget. I'll take it to my grave. But I never told anyone this story, my experience, never. Because after I had left Wounded Knee, after we, laid, after we left and we went our own ways, I didn't know I had PTSD because I, when, if you never, I thought I had a good mind. I thought I had a strong mind. That's why, you know, and, but if you, you know, if you're, if you're involved in something that's really violent, if you don't have a, a strong mind, you will, it will affect you. Mm. I'm telling you, because this is what happened to me, and I, you know, and I, uh, but experience is experience. Oh. Wow. Uh, amazing story. Yeah. Give her, that's an amazing story. I want, I want to give everyone a chance to answer this question. I want to start with uh, Joanne first. And I know in my own life, and I think everybody here has that time in their life where they'll always remember. And does it seem that long ago, and does this something that is a part of your memory today? 
Well, I wasn't sure of it, and I haven't been back here in 50 years, but I've done other activist things all my life, mostly in Chicago. But when this came up that this was happening and that our book was being reprinted, I, I got very, ex very excited, and I th I've been remembering many parts of the experience and many people ever since, and I know it had a big effect on me. I want the same question to you. As a single incident is different from sort of the broad. In terms of the broad, what, had, what stays with me strongest is the people I met, especially the people in Wounded Knee. As a single incident that played an important role in basically convincing me to return to law, I I'd, I'd clerked for a federal judge for a year, and then I started working for a nonviolent organization. And I wasn't sure you could be a lawyer and a decent human being at the same time. I had seen just enough lawyers to be very skeptical about that. Um, and well, sometime fairly late in the whole on the whole op operation, we, there was there were teams of medical teams coming in to relieve the other medical teams, and the government, as a, as part of its strategy of trying to wear people down. It was giving the medical teams a hard time coming in. And I remember very strongly, there was one me me the medical team that really had to get in because the other one really had to leave. They were getting really burned out. Doctors aren't that much stronger than lawyers and we're pretty weak. In any event, but they really had to change. And so they were seeking advice. And I remember the, the um, medical team telling me that they really trusted me, and that they didn't trust most lawyers. And I realized that it's not really that law makes people into, I want to say shits, but that's probably be blipped out, into, bad, into thoughtless people, but that a lot of thoughtless people become lawyers, and that law might encourage thoughtlessness. And then that's what convinced me that one could be a lawyer and a decent human being, and that's what I've tried to be ever since. Wow, yeah, it's just uh, amazing. But Donna, um, you've been through a lot of fights. You were at Standing Rock, I've seen you at Line 3 in Minnesota. Um, your work has just been unbelievable all these years. What, what sticks with your mind specifically about Wounded Knee? I think is uh, all the all of our people that came from all over the country and the unity. I mean, every every one of our nations was represented, and that that's again. I felt that uh, you know you don't, we're not alone. You know, it's just locally, nationally, and internationally. Because after Wounded Knee, that's what the elders told us. You know, we, we've got the world's attention, we need to go further. You know, so that it was just an, after Wounded Knee, it was just like, well, it, the next phase got laid out to us, you know, and we had some strong, amazing elders that had our back. So as the years went by, all the way up to Standing Rock, that's what, as, when I became an elder, I saw that that was the responsibility to show up and you don't have to say anything. You don't have to be on the mic. You know, you just show up so those young people know you have their back. Because our ancestors showed us that. And that's our strength, is our ancestral uh, memories. There was a lull uh, we talked uh, a couple years ago about that. This, it seemed like there was a lull of young people showing up to represent, and then Standing Rock happened, and people were looking up to warrior women like yourself, and you've expressed that you're really happy to see young people now show up to these, these events now, and with this great history from, from all you, um, these young ones can lean on it, but can you explain a little bit about that? There was a little lull people where were everyone, and then people showed up? Do you remember that conversation? Yeah, well, not 
Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I really forget for. Yeah. Anyway, but no, I just think in, you know the overall picture. You know, for me has been there was a lull. You know, of those years, but what the American Indian Movement taught me was everybody is is in the movement. Everybody is, if, if you're taking care of your family, if you're taking care of your children, if you're in school, if you're making it every day, that's a warrior, you know? So it doesn't always have to be an action, you know? It doesn't always have to be, you know, uh, glory, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, we were on the brink of you know, going, you know, circling the drain, you know, as a people. and. What Wounded Knee did, Alcatraz, and many of the other events, you know, of the of the day was just a spark, and from that we had flames, you oh. know. And so now we we have we have native media. You know, look at what you're doing. I mean, to me that's amazing because we didn't have that. We had to fight for that. We had to fight for every little thing, you know. So to me, everything's a is a step forward, whatever we do. Wow, I, 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 that, uh, that's amazing, and we're going we're gonna to end this, and I, I am just feel so blessed to be among these warrior women and you warriors out here. Um, I really, really appreciate this conversation and these stories um, and your experience. So I just want to say, Peeny Gigi, thank you so much to the Warrior Women Project, and thank you to all the Amster Gangsters. Ho -wa. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. I don't know. <laughs> okay, Thank you. Here she comes. All right, one more, one more big hand here for uh, the warrior women here, please. And Marcy. Chunk. <laughs> oh. Gigi. Thank you, Robert. So that was amazing. Thank you, ladies. History, man. This is our history. This is awesome. The stories that we don't hear, you know, the stories that aren't written in the book. I know uh, living history is, is important. And so Another reason for us to value our, our elderly and our veterans because they hold that valuable history that helps us move forward as young people, younger people. Um, so now what we're going to do is I just wanted, I just wanted to um, remind everybody about interviews. You met our, te our team who's willing to take interviews. We really hope to expand what we have. We have some stuff with Black Hills Alliance, some stuff with Weagle Doc. I'm hoping those of you from Weagle Doc will give us some interviews. Because I, I was just a little kid when you guys were doing your thing. <laughs> so I didn't really get to know anybody. I just knew you were all in that building over there and, <laughs> protecting us, protecting our, our families who were at Wounded Knee, or anybody, any Indian that was in jail. <laughs> That's what I thought anyway. <laughs> but yeah, we, want, we would like to expand. Anybody here from the survival school, we would like to get some interviews from you as well, any survival school. Uh, women of all Red Nations, in this way we want to, you know, sh uh, show our solidarity and, and action with all of you, the American Indian Movement and Wounded Knee Veterans and our families. So right now, I would like to introduce Mark Tilson, Jr. Thank you so much. I'm gonna give him a few minutes to share Thank you so much. some really good info with us right now. Thank you so much. 
It's oh, my privilege. Yeah. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I think my is my mic still. Hello. Turn my mic off. Good afternoon. Uh Wahopa Luta Machapolo Khahe sent the Awa T uh Yukpe Cha na Uklala Lakota Mie. My name is uh, Mark Kenneth Tilson. I'm Oglala Lakota. I'm from right here in Porcupine, South Dakota. I'm almost as old as Keeley Radio, so I'm about to be 40. Um, <laughs> uh, the, I was asked to come and speak today. Um, we have two books available for everyone in the room, and we'd like you all to grab uh, one copy each. And if you could leave your name with us and like just let us know how to get a hold of you and your name. That'll be a fair trade for two free books. And uh, one of the books is um, It Ain't Over Smo uh, Tell We're Smoking Cigars on the Drill Pad, which is a collection of my poems uh, I wrote about Standing Rock. And uh, the second book that we have is, uh, I feel is to be much, much, much more important and historical. It's Voices from Wounded Knee. Um, I grew up with this book. Uh, I think we had a third edition, maybe, a, and it was fall, by the time I was a teenager, it was already falling apart. It was, the cover was torn, uh, had coffee stains all over it, and I felt like, it felt like, you know, at the time, uh, 30 years ago felt like such a long piece of history. It felt ancient. Everything was black and white back then. We have the evidence. And Standing Rock happened. And I was out there off and on for five and a half months. And uh, I started working with my brother, reluctantly, and, hopefully, and very uh, happily, though, as the librarian for Indian Collective. And before I became a full-time organizer, uh, my colleague, Tom Swiftward, brought in his grandma's uh, first edition copy. And I sat down and I read it cover to cover, and I felt kind of changed as a person. I felt like I was connected to my elders because we lived such a similar experience. Some things were so incredibly different. Um, you know, there's... There's photographs and tapes and transcripts that needed to be smuggled out on horseback uh, during the occupation of Wounded Knee. And this book is made from some of, the, some of those documents and photographs. Um, and at, you know, at Standing Rock, informing the entire planet about what we're doing was as easy as a push of a button. We went live on Facebook, Instagram, live tweeting on Twitter. And so there's things that were so incredibly different. And the similarities was like kind of the pompous bravado of the press conferences. And you could see it right in the book. And I was like, I bet I know what that was really like sitting there. Like you, like, and there's some, mo there's some moments of just absolute, absolute sublime beauty and presence. Um, you can... Smell, when you read the book, you can smell gunpowder. You can smell the tobacco. You can smell the coffee. You can smell the soap from the hand washing of clothes. And there's part of camp life that's just universal. And there's part of our struggle that's universal. And one of the things that was so beautiful and profound to me is seeing, seeing the same faces and seeing the same showing up throughout history, throughout time. Maybe like reincarnations of real, genetics are just that strong, or there's something spiritual going on, and our struggle is intergenerational, truly. And being part of the reprinting of this book, um, we've raised money and just independently, mostly from the people of Wickledock who have generously taken on this project, has a contribution to this anniversary and to all of these events that are going on. We don't ask for any money at all for this. Um, 
except for those of you who can really afford to. We're, we're 3K short. We'll get there. I'm not worried. Um, but I think if we tried to make money off of this, whatever spirit that was fostering this book to come back into a creation wouldn't be there. So this is truly a labor of love from the people who created the book, who generously let us bring this book back into the world. And um, to the people, Jose Barrera said like, well, technically you probably should ask uh, the Mohawk Nation for permission, but um, you could probably ask forgiveness if they got upset. <laughs> and uh, the, originals, the originals burned down in a fire. That's, that's just the truth of it. And um, uh, this is going to be embarrassing for a good friend of mine, but uh, Kevin Brown, can you please come down here? Kevin Brown has been working with my family for over 25 years. He's had an independent print shop in Minneapolis. <laughs> Testing, there we go. Um, Kevin has operated himself in the movement with the highest integrity of possible of, being, of helping projects come into the world. Uh, he helped me do my first book, the second printing, the third printing, and um, it has not left him the most financially successful person I've ever met. <laughs> and this was honestly the type of regard and awe and respect that Kevin and his team one of, the, one of our folks donated a uncirculated uh, museum quality edition and we took it apart piece by piece with a scalpel to remake this book. And the regard that this was held with was like the way that somebody would hold a sacred object. And um, for Kevin, uh, for all the decades of work that you've done, and has an honoring for putting this back into a, bringing this, uh, donating your time and putting so much labor into this, driving this out through a snowstorm to get here. Um, I'm going to honor you with this blanket. And uh, yeah. And uh, we'll be handing these out, and so make sure you walk away with one of my books and one of uh, Voices from Wounded Knee. Thank you. Awesome, Mark. Thank you. Okay, before the mad rush, we got this organized, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to ask Wyatt to come up, and he'll give you some details. Right now for the good stuff, all the all the free swag, all the t-shirts, stickers, we got some good stuff. Um, so what we're going to do is we'd really like to get some feedback um, on the exhibit, on your experience today. Um, if you have any relatives um, that were in this exhibit, um, if you have any stories about them or Wounded Knee um, that you would like to share. Uh, your favorite experience or moment of the event, what did you take away from the exhi exhibit, and what did you learn? Anything missing, anything that we could improve on. Um, this isn't, you know, the, um, the a, a comprehensive history of Wounded Knee. I don't know if we'll ever be able to get there, and so knowing that we will want to continue to build on uh, what's been presented here today. Um, and then we want this to be a traveling exhibit, and so, um, and shown in different places. So if you have any suggestions on where it could be shown and um, uh, put up at in different places and spaces. So there is um, a feedback form here. Raya has her uh, arms up over here. Um, as you move through the exhibit, go through there, engage with it. There are tablets um, where you'll see examples of the interview clips 
um, engage with that, meet with people, talk with people. Uh, some of those, um, obviously, that you know have been here, um, engage with them, uh, move through, and then at the end, pick up your um, evaluation form. And then if you turn it into the table, we'll give you a free um, gift bag that has one of the t-shirts that all of the team is wearing here. Um, and then, let's see here, there's stickers, and I can't, um, buttons? I can't remember all the different things that are in there, but lots of really um, amazing stuff. So, go, oh, and also um, pick up then your copy of the uh, Voices for Wounded Knee and the other uh, book that was mentioned as well. Um, so that's kind of the plan. Um, but also before I wrap up here, I also wanted to acknowledge and just say a few words about, you know, um, again, in my introduction, uh, that Marcy gave, it was mentioned that I got my start with the Warrior Women Project during undergrad. And I can remember when uh, Madonna came to uh, a class of ours and I was first introduced to her. And, you know, she often talked about like, we need to get the, the youth involved and more engaged in this history. We need to teach them, we need to talk to them about what happened because we can't rely on you know, the, the Western version of what this history is. We need to share our own stories, our own experiences. And I still hold that um, and carry that with me. I also remember there was a time when um, Marcy did an interview, um, part of a oral history uh, training that we did. And I remember one of the quotes that still replays in my head is uh, she talks about how we have to figure out what kind of elders uh, we're going to be so that the, the youth and generations that are coming up, uh, when they have answers or when they have questions, we'll have answers for them. And so um, both of these women, you know, I really look up to and have encouraged me to be involved in these things. And I think that's part of this effort to get more people involved and engaged, sharing your voices and stories. Um, I also want to recognize, uh, you know, Beth and the work that she's done. Um, you know, she was my professor and helped to really encourage me and get me involved in this and, you know, was just like, it's going to be a long road, but I'm in it, and if you'd come along with me, um, I've stuck with her uh, through all of this, and, you know, there's a lot of other students that have come along the way that haven't been able to be here with us, um, but again, just wanting to give a huge shout out to Beth, Madonna, and Marcy for getting all of this work going, because without them, none of this um, story or exhibit would be here and just wanting to really lift them up and um, say, Wopita. Thanks, Wyatt. Okay, so at this time, we're gonna invite you to the exhibit. Um, also, we have a, a swag table over there for those of you who, who want to purchase some of our lotions and soaps and um, headbands and things like that. And all those proceeds go to the efforts that we, that we, you know, the oral history project, gas for the grandmothers. I mean, it's usually gas money. Hey, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, any donations, if you want to make a donation and buy some products, we'd really appreciate that. So you're welcome to see the biz exhibit, do your feedback form, grab your books, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you for coming. I also want to recognize the author of Voices. One more time. The author, Voices of Wounded Knee. So thankful she's here. And Winkle Doc, before you guys take off, Winkle Doc, can I visit with you, please? I'll meet you over there in that corner.
Before everybody takes off, Lavetta would like to share some gifts. I want to say, aho, to the to the people that have invited me and let me be to take a stand with you people for your people and for the woke woman warrior project. Beth Castle, would you please come forward?